But the moment we don't see him, our whole attitude changes, our whole demeanor changes. And sometimes we find ourselves even mad at him, right? Tell so your neighbor again, it's not what you see. It's not what you see. You ever hear someone say, my eyes are playing tricks on me? In a sense, they do, right? Because especially when we're looking through our physical eye, rather our spiritual eye. The enemy uses what we see through our physical eye to try to trick us into believing that God isn't moving or doing what he said that he would. Amen. Ben Franklin said the way to see by faith is to shut the eye of reason. In other words, the things that take faith can't be explained. And a lot of times it won't even make sense. God will have you doing stuff and you don't even understand what it is that he's having you to do. But that's why it takes faith to believe God to do the possible, the impossible. What is our spiritual eye? It's the word of God in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13 says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Don't try to figure out your situations or try to work up on something. Just trust God to do the impossible. Mark 10, 27 says, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Martin Luther King Jr. said, you don't have to see the whole staircase just to take the first step. Amen? Amen. That's, that's self-explanatory. You don't have to see the manifestation of God's promises first in order to believe what he said. Amen. We have to believe what he said first in order to see the manifestation of it. It's just like your steps in your house. Once you move into a new home and you become acquainted with the steps, you know they're there. So you don't even take a second thought before you just automatically go and walk up the steps. Same thing with God. When he tells us something, we can't second guess it. Amen? We have to take him at his word. James 2.17 says, faith without works is dead. What are the works? Praying, fasting, reading, speaking, and believing the word of God. Obedience, heeding to the unctions of the Holy Spirit, and preparing for what God has promised us. If God promised you a house, start looking. If he promised you marriage, start preparing. If he promised you healing, start confessing. If he promised you a job, start applying. A lot of times God promises us something, we wait for him just to drop it down out the sky, right? We have a part to do in that too. He ain't just going to give it to us. And, and again, faith, I say faith is like a muscle. The more you work it, the stronger it gets. Amen? Let's look at the word evidence. It comes from the Greek word elankos, meaning a proof or that by which a thing is proved or tested. God lets us know that we can take him at his word. Amen? We can prove his word. We see God proving himself all the time throughout scripture. As a matter of fact, God is so confident in himself that he gives us the choice to choose him. Biblical faith comes from careful observations and the weighing of all available evidence. So I've known God to do the impossible and his word backs it up. Amen. In the Old Testament, they were promised a savior, someone that would be sent to redeem and to save the world. So how much easier should it be for us here today to believe in the promise that's already been manifested, right? Jesus has already gave his life, he's already come. So if that promise came to fruition, is that not the same God then, today, and forever? Amen. Faith is like a radar that sees through the fog. I heard this parable, a man was flying home on the airplane, and initially when the plane took off, there was sunny skies, the blue skies were clear, you know, smooth, smooth out flying. And then all of a sudden, so far into the flight, it started storming, the winds was blowing, there was a bunch of turbulence, you couldn't see for miles because the skies had gotten dark. However, the pilot didn't stop flying the plane, right? What he did was switch over to the instruments that he had been given to keep the plane flying. What am I saying? When the enemy starts throwing things at you, your attitude has to be like, I may be experiencing some turbulence in my life right now, but I'm switching over to the instruments that I've been given because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Mm -hmm. What is that instrument? Faith, trusting and believing that God is there in the midst of never leaving or forsaking and holding true to his promises. Mm -hmm. The word says that he's not a man that he should lie, right? So if he said it, what are we worried about? 
sometimes a lot easier said than done, though, right? If he ain't moving when we feel like he needs to move, then we start getting a little shaky and it's like, okay, Lord, I only got a couple more days, but God is not moved by time. We put God in the time box, right? But we know the Bible says that a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years to one day when it comes to God, right? He's not on our time frame. We're on his. We have to trust that even though in our eyes it may look like he's not on time, but God is an on-time God. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Speaking the word during your trials helps to build your faith and it helps you to build your relationship with God. You begin to trust him more and more because you first have to trust him before you can believe him. You can't believe somebody that you don't trust. So anytime it, it gets close to me having to speak, um, I, I get tested in my faith a whole lot. I start getting nervous and I try to talk myself out of not having to speak. And it's in those moments where God is like, he said to Ezekiel, when I give you a word, you have to get it for yourself first, right? And so I'm speaking about faith, but I'm having to get this, this word for myself first Amen. in order for me to be able to give it. Amen? Amen. So you all don't know my story. You don't know where I come from. You don't uh, know the things that I've been through. Just to give a brief portion of my testimony, um, I wouldn't have time to, t to tell it all today even if I wanted to. But I grew up in the church. Um, my family initially didn't go to church. Um, I grew up in the church. My grandmother, we lived with my grandmother. My mom was a teenage mother, so we stayed with my grandparents. And every morning, my grandmother would be in there reading her word and praying. And she would be watching uh, Fred Price and John Hagee and Kenneth Copeland and all those pastors on TV. And I'll be sitting right there on the couch watching her. And she would have this big white book. And she would be sitting there, and her eyes would be closed, and her mouth would be moving. I would just sit as a child and just admire her doing that. And every Sunday morning, I would go up my granddad to the local market to get the Sunday paper. He'll get his coffee, and he'll get me a little Debbie cake, and that was like a Sunday thing. But I noticed at the corner where they lived was this brick building, and I would see people going in there all the time, dressed up, and I was curious about this building. So one Sunday morning, I had woke up before everybody else did, and I went to the drawer, got me a dress, and I snuck out the back door and ran up the alley because I was going to find out what was going on in this building. And so I had walked into the building, and as I walked in, this man and woman had met me at the door, and they asked me, you know, who I was, what my family was, and I'm like, they're asleep. And the lady asked me a question. She said, do you know Jesus? I was like, no. And she's like, well, you know, you can have him come live in your heart. And she's like, do you want that? And I'm like, yes. And so, you know, she had me repeat a few things after her, and then after we got done, she told me that Jesus was in my heart, he was always going to be with me. She gave me a snack, and she sent me back home. And as I got to the top of the alley, running back down the alley, all my family was out screaming and yelling for me. And I'm running down the alley saying, I have Jesus, I have Jesus, he's in my heart, he's in my heart. Not even knowing who Jesus was, but I knew that this person told me that I had somebody in my heart. I couldn't tell my friends because I couldn't show him, right? But I remember walking around as a kid with this secret that there's somebody living in my heart that other people can't see. I can't even see him, but I know that he's in my heart. At 10, um, my uncle had relocated back to Tennessee and he had opened up his own church. And at that time, that's when my parents had started going to church. And my dad, at that time, he ordained a deacon. Um, and, and my dad, he's not my biological father, but he raised me from the time I was two years old. So that's my father. Um, and so we were all going to church as a family. And then at 13, I had started going to the church that I recently left prior to moving to South Carolina. And when I was 17, my pastor of that church passed away. And for me, that was devastating because he was the only positive male figure in my life at that time because prior to my dad joining church, he was an alcoholic, he abused my mother, he verbally abused me, and I watched him beat my mom, and there were so much things that went on. And then my granddad, he was a male figure, but he was also the person that molested me. And so I didn't have that male role model, that positive male role model in my life, except for my pastor. So when he passed away, it was devastating. And at that time, I seen people in the church doing things that I just, I knew wasn't of God. And so at 17 years old, I left the church. From 17 to 25, I was out in the world living a rebellious life. I was drinking, smoking, fornicating, selling drugs, had people selling drugs from me, been in all the wrong places at the wrong time. I've been in places where there was crossfire. <laughs> yeah. 
Don't, don't nobody outside. <laughs> I've been delivered, but I didn't always live this life, amen? There were places where I was being, like I said, I could have been dead. Crossfire, bullets going in front of me, just being with the wrong people at the wrong time. And when I, when I think back, there, I shouldn't be here today. I should either be dead or in jail because of the life that I was living, amen? But my grandmother, she had taught me how to pray and how to read scripture. So that's one thing that never left me. Even though I was out in the world doing the things that I was doing, I would still read, I would still pray. So I truly believe that is what kept me during those moments where I could have been taken out. Amen. Like I say, I, I was, you name it, I did. Um, in 2005, I had my daughter. And so by then, I had stopped partying and going to the club and stuff. But at that point in time, I was now dealing with a completely different demon. I was dealing with depression and isolation. I had actually, shortly after she was born, I had moved to Atlanta because that's where her dad is from. So I had moved there thinking I was going to have a family and everything, and it didn't turn out that way. Um, she and I ended up living in a hotel, and I had went through all my savings. I was on my last dollar. And I remember I had turned on the television that morning, and John Hagee was on there. And I remembered him from watching him with my grandmother as a child. And they had a prayer line. And so I had called into the prayer line, and the lady prayed with me. And then I just went out the hotel. My, my brother had actually came up to visit. And so I left him and my daughter in the hotel room. And I walked around the hotel, and I just went and sat on the curb. And I was like, God, is this it? Is this, is this my life? I don't understand. And I just started crying out to him. And I remember when I was sitting there, this guy drives by, and he's like, what's wrong? And I was like, you know, I didn't spend the last of my money, and I don't, I don't want to go back to Tennessee because in my family's eyes, I'm living it up in Atlanta, right? But that wasn't the case. And so I couldn't, thank you, I couldn't go to back home to Tennessee and let everybody know that I had failed in Atlanta, right? They didn't even know that I was living in a hotel with my child. And so I didn't want to go back and face that ridicule. And so... Um, he had offered me a job stripping, and I considered it. I didn't do it, but I did Come consider it. <laughs> I didn't get on it. I almost did. <laughs> but it wasn't, not too many days after that, I had gotten a, a settlement check in the mail. So God was starting to hear my cry. So with that settlement check, I was able to uh, move me and my daughter moved into a gated community. Um, was nice. I ended up getting a job at a letter psychiatry neurology as a medical assistant. And you know, things were going good and I felt like I was finally slowly getting back on track. And I remember every morning I would drive to work, I'd listen to Smokey Norfolk and Yolanda Adams every morning I worship. Even with my blunt in my hand, but I was still, I was still worshiping. <laughs> It was so bad. When I moved back to Tennessee, I was actually working at a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center, knowing well when I went home, I was about to roll up. So I'm here counseling people, but when I go home, so I, I got that counseling myself while I was counseling others, but that's in a, a whole different story in itself. Amen. But like I say, I was slowly every day crying out to God, listening to Smokey Norfolk um, and Yolanda Adams. And so 2007, Thanksgiving, I had went back to Tennessee for Thanksgiving, and I had heard about the new pastor that was at the church that I had came from, and so I was like, well, I'll go and see, you know, what he's talking about, and because normally when I would come in, I would leave out that Sunday morning and go back to Atlanta, but this particular Sunday, I felt the urge to go to church, and so I went to church service that morning, and everything that the pastor was speaking that morning was like hitting me, it just hitting me. And so at the end of service, he said, there's some of you that need God to move on your behalf right now. He said, if that describes you, form a, a line in the aisle. And so I got up in that line, and from the time I walked into that line, I just cried out to God like never before. And he finally came to me in the line. He said, why are you here? I was like, you know, I used to be a member here. I moved to Atlanta. Yeah. He's like, no, why are you here? And I just kind of looked at him, and he said, God said, it's time. And so when I left service that day, it's time, it kept resonating in my spirit, it's time, it's time. And so I told my mom, I said, I'm moving back to Tennessee. And she said, when? I said, tonight. She said, okay. 
So I took my cousin, we went to Atlanta, I packed everything that I could, and I moved back that very same night. Because what I've learned, when God is moving, you need to move quickly, and then, and so in my mind, I was coming back to Tennessee, but I had no clue that I was coming back to my father, and then I didn't know the plans that he had for me. And so I had moved back to Tennessee um, Thanksgiving 2007, and slowly God was just cutting layers off, a little bit at a time. He was shaping me and pruning me and molding me. Slowly things were being removed from me. And finally, by 2008, I was delivered from alcohol. I was delivered from, because I would drink every night, smoke every day. Those were my coping mechanisms so that I didn't have to deal with the pain and everything else that I was feeling. And so to, to keep myself numb, I would smoke from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed. If I woke up in the middle of the night, I smoked to go back to sleep and I had my drink every night. And that's how I functioned every day. And so God had delivered me from the alcohol and the, the drugs and fornication. In October 2008, I made a vow to God. I said, God, if you take this from me, I will serve you. And I made a vow of celibacy unto him. And ever since October 2008, God has been keeping me. And then one thing I learned about God, if you want to be kept, he'll keep you. But you have to have your mind made up that that's what you want. Deliverance is, is based on your wants, right? Either you want it. Amen. You hurt enough till you have to, or you hurt enough to where it's uncomfortable. You know, I don't want to stand this. I don't want to feel used anymore. I don't want to feel abused anymore, God. I know there's more for me. And so he delivered me from that. And, you know, like I say, I was molested as a child, watched my dad beat my mother. I ended up being a college dropout. But come May this year, I'm graduating with my master's. Yeah. You know, I, I, I had an opportunity to travel to different countries on missions trips. Back in 2018, I was actually able to take my daughter to Africa with me on a missions trip. If someone would have told me back then, where I would be today, I'd probably laugh in their face. The things that I've seen, the things that I've experienced, the things that I've done, the things that I've had done to me, especially in the church, there's no way you could have told me then that I was going to be in ministry today. That was the furthest thing from my mind. Amen? And I'm like, God, are you sure you want to use somebody like me? Like, you know me. <laughs> you see what I was doing, right? Like, are you sure you want to use somebody like me? Um, there was no way that I was having faith to believe that God could take somebody so dirty and use them. But one thing that I've learned, you know, back in the day, we were taught, you need to get yourself together before you come to God. But I thank God that he gave me a different revelation. You know, a lot of times we think that, uh, and I, I'm reminded of the woman with the issue of blood, you know, back in the Jewish custom, a woman that was unclean, if she touched the priest, she would be stoned to death, right? So here she is touching Jesus, the high priest. So, but she was so desperate for God and so desperate for the healing, she didn't care who she made unclean because any one or anything that she touched was considered unclean. But she had made up in her mind, the doctors couldn't do it, right? My money couldn't do it. There's only one person that can do it. So despite me making you unclean or despite what you're thinking about me, I got to get to Jesus. I need a touch from the Lord. And so we have to be so desperate enough that we don't pay attention to the people around us. It's just like when you go to the doctor in the emergency room, you ain't paying attention to who in the waiting room. I even see the doctor. Amen. So uh, we can use people as excuses all the time when we come to church. But when we come into those doors, our focus needs to be him and not the people that's around here. Amen. And like I said, I'm preaching to myself first because sometimes it can be easy to get distracted by people and the things that they're saying. But one thing that I've learned is my validation comes from God. And, God Amen. and so we have to learn. That, that God is, is our validator. Yes. And so we have to be desperate enough for God to push through our emotions, to push through yes. our situations, to push through our feelings, to push through what people are saying, to push through what people are doing, to push through how they're looking at us, what they're yes. wishing. Who right. cares? Amen. Yes, right. I need yes. Jesus. Yes. And that's how I was. I had, I had to get a touch from him. And so, you know, in our mind, and, and I can picture the woman you know, if I touch Jesus, I'm going to make him unclean. That's probably what she was thinking. But the thing is, when we get a touch from God, we can't make him unclean. The only thing that can happen is 
he'll clean us up. Amen. We're never too dirty from him. Amen. And so I thank God for his grace and his mercies. And it's because of his grace and mercy that we have not been consumed and that his grace is sufficient for each and every day. So again, I just I just thank God. And I remember there was a time in ministry where I had enough. I was like, Lord, these folks is crazy. Like, I didn't deal with that out in the world. <laughs> People were more loyal in the streets than they were in the church. And so I was like, I was like, Lord, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this. And so I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And so when I was sitting there crying out to him, ready to throw in the towel, ready to give up, he reminded me of when I was five years old and I ran out the alley. He said, I drew you by my spirit that day. It was on that day that I chose you. And I began to understand that before I was a person, I was a purpose, right? God does everything on purpose and with purpose. We're not a mistake. If we're here today, that means we're here on purpose, right? And so we have to realize that we was a plan and a purpose before we was even a person. Amen. And so keeping that in our forefront, understanding the fact that, yes, I will go through, yes, you know, there's going to be naysayers. Jesus told us that we'll suffer persecution for him. And so reminding ourselves of that daily helps us not to be so quick to give up, to give up. And like I say, that's what helps me to keep growing and to help me keep going. Do I have my moments? Yes, we all do. But we can't stay there. Amen. We have to have enough faith to know that no matter what we have been through, no matter what we're going through, there's purpose behind it all. And it's all working out for our good. I know what Luke 12, 48 means when he says, to whom much is given, much is required. God has done so much for me. If I had 10,000 tongues, I still couldn't tell it all. Amen. In the midst of the turmoil and feeling like I was about to lose my mind, again, I had to remember to switch over to the instruments that I had been given. And in return, he kept my mind on perfect peace. During depression, greater was he. During isolation, greater was he. In the abuse, greater was he. In the letdown, greater was he. In the sorrow, greater was he. In sickness, greater was he. In loneliness, greater was he. When it came to the drugs and the alcohol, greater was he. We have to learn to see God greater than our circumstances and our situations. And that in itself takes faith. We all know the story of Joseph over in Genesis 37. And I've heard a lot of people say, you know, Joseph wants to tell everybody his dreams and maybe his brothers want to come up against him. But when you go over to Genesis 50 and 20, at the end, when his brothers were apologizing, he said to them, but as for you, That's right. ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, yeah, right. to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. It was purpose for Joseph to be thrown into the pit in order to save his family. Amen. His faith in God helped him to understand why he went through what he went through and, and it caused him to trust God the more. And so it was purpose for Joseph to go through. Sometimes we are the vessel that God will use in order to get the attention of other people. It's not always about us. Amen. Sometimes we think the things that we're going through is about us and everything is not about us. Amen. And, and I like to refer to PIT as the acronym purpose in transition. We don't know what that transition looks like, amen? It, we think that once we receive Jesus as our first one to say, everything's going to be good. Uh, he didn't say everything was going to be good. As a matter of fact, he said just the opposite. I don't know where along the line that people thought when you make up your mind and come to church, you just want to live a perfect life. That's far from the truth. We, perfection is reaching maturity, right? We're not fully perfected until we get with him. But while we're here, we're constantly striving for that perfection. And again, like I say, there was um, purpose in Joseph being thrown in the pit. There's purpose in the things that I went through. There's purpose in the things that you went through, things that you still may be going through. Like I say, anytime we profess to be a Christian, that puts a target on our back for the enemy. You know what I'm saying? Because he doesn't want us to see the, the promises that God has for us. He doesn't want us to live that life that God has called us to. That's why we can't give up in the midst of adversity. We have to stay in position despite the turmoil if we want to reach that palace. Joseph had a purpose and a calling on his life. God had already showed him the dreams 
that he was going, um, where he was going in his dreams. The enemy knew this, so he brought distractions and situations, and he used those closest to him, which oftentimes, that's who he likes to use, are the people closest to us to try to get us off, to try to get us to quit, to try to get, a, get us to, um, to give up. But when the enemy brings about distractions, we have to speak the word. We have to tell him, I'm not focusing on you right now. I'm keeping my eyes toward the hills when it's coming to my help because I know that my help comes from the Lord. Amen. The, the word says that he comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He's a father of lies. So we can't allow him to put those lies into our minds and to cause that to move us out of the will of God. And so it's just like when, even with Jesus. He was saying, trying to tempt Jesus, but Jesus spoke the word back to him. We have to speak the word back to our situations. We need to confess it out of our minds daily. Sister Sabrina was saying in Sunday school this morning, we have to renew our minds daily with the word, just as Romans 12 says. So in this season, in this year, you know, 2020 was a year. I thank God because even in the midst of everything that's going on, he still kept me. He blessed me. He moved me to two states over. Didn't know where I was going to end up. But I thank God that he went ahead of me. And had I not had that faith to step out, I would still probably be back in Tennessee in self-bondage because I would be choosing not to move out on faith. But because I took that step, I left the familiar, I left my family, I uprooted my child, I uprooted our life and came to a whole new state where I didn't know anybody, hadn't even been to Columbia in my life because I trusted and I had been tired of being sick and tired. When you get tired of being sick and tired, it'll move you. And so that's where I was, and I thank God that I made that choice to step out in faith, because look where I am today. He's placed me in, in a ministry where there's there's leaders that recognize the gifts in me and won't take no for an answer. So I thank God for, for the pushing, because we need that push, right? God will push you around people that will help to build you up. And I thank God for that, because sometimes it takes people like them to see something that you don't even see in yourself. And God will use that to help to grow you and to mature you. And so I thank God for that. Amen. Like I say, in this season, God is looking for praisers. They sent the praisers out in battle in the Old Testament, right? Amen. Praise brought down the walls of Jericho. It was the praise of Paul and Silas that shook the foundation of the prison that caused the chains to not only release them, but it released the other prisons. Like I said, what you're going through is not about you, amen? And so we have to learn to praise God in the midst of what we're going through because praise confounds the enemy. He will confuse you. He won't be able to understand you. I sent that trap for you, but you're praising God. You know, people won't understand that when they came up against you, they thought that was going to take you out. But oh, wait, she's still praising God. How are they still praising God in the midst of what they're going through? Can you praise God when there's no money in your account? Can you praise God? when the doctors give you bad news? Can you praise God when family turns their backs on you? Can you praise God when your friends aren't in your corner? Can you praise God when it feels like every door in your life has been shut in your face? Can you praise God when it seems like he's not even hearing from you? Can you praise God when it seems like he shut the door to you? Can you praise God when it seems like there's no hope anywhere that you look? Can you praise God when there's pain in your body that you don't understand? Can you praise God when you have children that's out on the street? Can you praise God when you've been praying for them and praying for their deliverance but it seems like they're not even hearing that God's work's not even moving on their behalf? Can you praise God in the midst of what you're going through? Can you praise God Worship. That's why he tried so hard to hinder your praise and to hinder your worship. 
because he knows the power that is in your praise and in your worship. Amen. Faith and praise go hand in hand. Amen. And so we, we worship God for who he is, but we praise him for what he's done, Amen. is doing, and will continue to do. Amen. And so, like I said, we have to be able to step out of our comfort zones. Who cares who's watching? Because like I said, they don't know what you're going through. You can mock my praise. You can laugh at my praise. I still want to praise my praise. deliverance in your praise. There's breakthrough in your praise. There's salvation for that family member, that loved one in your praise. Everything that you stand in need of is in your praise. And we have to praise God as if our life depended on it. Amen. So I pray that in this season that God will put us praise a, a spirit of praise down on the inside of us like never before that our yes. first reaction will be to praise God. When you, the doctor called and said whatever he had to say, God, I thank you. Yes. When the doctor says, I'm sorry, but I got to let you go, God, I thank you. Yes. If that eviction notice is on the door, God, I thank you. If I open up the refrigerator and there's only a bottle of water, God, I thank you. Because we have to learn and trust that no matter what it looks like, he's still working it out for my good. Amen. And we have to trust that there's so much greater that lies ahead, but we have to learn to praise God in the midst of what we're going through. Amen. God said in this season, if they will learn to praise me in the midst of what they're going through, I will make available everything that they need in that praise. So for those of you that like to sit down on your praise, I would admonish you in this season to get yourself out of the way. We recognize that he is Abba, my father. He's Jehovah Jireh, my yes. provider. He's Jehovah Rapha, the yes. God that heals. He is El Shaddai, yes. God Almighty. He is the great I am. There's not enough words to describe the magnitude of his greatness, amen, of his goodness. There's power just at the mission of his name. The word says that if I call upon the name of Jesus, I shall be saved. Yes. So in the midst of what I'm going through, I'm calling out Jesus. Amen. Lord, I need a touch from you. Jesus, amen. amen. And so in the midst of you don't have anything else to say, call on his name and things will begin to happen. Your atmosphere will begin to shift. Things will begin to change in your life. There will be a shundo. You know what a shundo is? A shundo is a turnaround. Amen. Bishop Noel Jones said that we connect to God in the spirit of faith. And that means that our minds have to be powerful enough to overcome our circumstances by the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Remember that there's no situation too hard for God. Stop looking at your situation through your physical eyes and through your senses, but start to look at it through your spiritual eyes. Amen. Tell your neighbor, it's not what you see. It's not what you see. It's what you believe. Amen. Let's put our hands together.